morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Open your Bibles if you have them with you to Psalm 62 uh, this morning as we look at a text that deals with a subject that I believe every believer uh, has a need for these days. Right? Rest for the weary soul. Uh, if you're one of those rare individuals uh, that, that doesn't need rest for your weary soul right now, uh, I'm certain that you'll need it sooner or later. All right, so just, just take what you hear this morning and store it away because I promise you, you, you will need it sooner or later. Amen. But for the rest of us, <laughs> for the rest of us, for the majority of us, I would say, the, the, the first eight verses of this psalm prove to be quite useful to us right now because for many of us, our souls are weary right now right and not it used to be or, or, or it might be later but but right now is where we need rest I believe one of the many misconceptions of, of being a Christian is that uh, once you follow Christ once you give your life to Christ everything all your troubles just melt away right everything just gets so much easier uh, all the all the troubles go away and just everything is wonderful that's simply not true. That's, right. Right? That's simply not true. We're not immune to life's hardships. I think, in fact, I would say uh, hardships are multiplied once you're following Jesus. Uh, we're not immune from tragedies. We're not immune from frustration and seasons of discouragement. Right? None of these things. They're, in fact, uh, they're common to those who are following after Jesus. And as Christians, we're certainly not immune from the weariness of our souls, even though they have been reconciled with God and they belong to Jesus. We still become weary in our souls. When we were lost in our sins, we were blinded and indifferent to our own sins, right? Sin didn't bother us back then, but it bothers us now, right? It should. When we were lost in our sins, we were primarily concerned about our own needs. But once Jesus saved us, our eyes were open to who we are. We see ourselves for who we are and what we truly are. We're struggling sinners that have been saved by God's grace, right? Some would just say a sinner saved by grace. But we're struggling along the way. Struggling to be who Christ has made us into. To be who we're supposed to be. When Jesus saved us, our eyes were open to the needs of others around us, right? We, we see things differently. When Jesus saved us, our eyes were open to the pain around us, the sufferings in others. When Jesus saved us, our eyes were open to, and now we see the world like Jesus sees the world. We see the good, we see the bad, and we see the ugly. We see all of it like Jesus does. You see, being a Christian means becoming more and more like Christ. That means that we should be becoming more and more compassionate towards others, not less. In this climate we live in, the world we live in, the culture we live in, it's real tempting to become hard-hearted towards others. But if we're to be like Christ, we must be more compassionate, not less compassionate. It means that we should be becoming more and more sensitive to the needs of others, their spiritual needs, their emotional needs, their physical needs. It means that we can't just tune out and ignore the world around us. That's what some do, right? They check out. I'm just not going to watch the news anymore. I'm just going to live in fantasy land. I'm just going to just stay home. I'm just going to shut out everybody around me because it's just too hard, too negative. I just don't want to be a, around that. But you see, as Father of Christ, we, we, can't, we're, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. Sure. It means that we must be engaged in the lives of other people around us. And that can get pretty messy at times. Amen? Amen. Very messy. But isn't that what we've been called to do as far as of Christ? To engage. Right? We're called to be the salt and the light. How can we be the salt and the light if we're not engaged? Haven't we been called to fight the good fight of faith? Not to cower in the corner. Get our blankie and suck our thumbs till the bad times pass. Haven't we been called to be the hands and feet of Jesus? How can we do that if we're not Engaged if we're hiding away from the mean, evil world. Haven't we been given the ministry of reconciliation? 
How can we reconcile people to Christ if we're not willing to engage people? To get out in the mud and the muck. And yes, all these things can be difficult and quite costly. Amen? We know this. Every time we invest time and energy into someone else's life and we experience rejection, that causes weariness to our souls, does it not? Does to me. Even though we know that James 4.17 says to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him it's sin still causes us to be weary in our souls. Every time that we share the gospel with the lost and it's met with indifference or open hostility, that causes weariness to our souls. Even though Jesus told us that it would be this way. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. You see, we know this. We believe God's Word. We know that many aren't going to respond to the Gospel. Many will reject it, but yet it still causes us to be weary in our souls. It troubles us. When we keep praying for God to deliver a friend or a loved one from the bondage of addiction and deliverance hasn't come yet, that causes us to be weary in our souls. When we keep pleading with God to be the great physician and bring healing and wholeness to the people that we care about and it's delayed or it never comes, that absolutely causes weariness to our souls. Everyone in this room knows this to be true. Even though we're told to not grow weary while doing good for in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. That's what Galatians 6, 9 says. So let me just ask you this morning, it's, it's almost a rhetorical question because I know the answer. Is your soul weary this morning? Do you need rest for the weariness of your soul this morning? If so, you're in the right place and you're among the right people. The church is the right place and God's people are the right people to find the rest for the weariness of your soul. That's what we're told in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 1-3. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. This has always been a, a struggle for God's people. Amen? That's right. It's normal. So you may be sitting here this morning and say, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be this way. I, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't be weary in my soul. I should be stronger than this. You're normal. You're normal. It's normal to experience these episodes, these feelings. If you need rest for your weary soul, you're in the right place. And you're among the right people. If you need rest for your soul, you're definitely not alone. You're definitely not alone. King David was an expert in this matter. Let us learn from his expertise this morning. Let's grab our Bibles now and let's stand together if you are able as we honor the reading of God's Word. Psalm 62. This is a psalm of, of David and he begins in verse 1. He says, Truly my soul silently awaits for God. From Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth because they curse inwardly. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectations from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. 
And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times. You people, pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. This is God's Word. Father, we come before You this morning confessing that we do have weariness in our souls. And Father, we ask that You would lift our faces. God, that, that You would help us to, to, to see the world as You see the world. That You would give us the, the strength and the encouragement that we need uh, to face this world. To, to be the followers of Christ. To be the salt and the light. To be the, the ambassadors of reconciliation that You've called us to be. God, just help us. Help us to be the church that You want us to be. Help us to be the, the, the saints that You've created us to be. God, we thank You for this Word to us this morning. We thank You for the example of David and his dependence upon You when he found himself in these seasons where he had deep weariness in his own soul. So Father, help us look to not just to David, but to look to Your Word for the answers that we need today. We love You and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We can't be certain of which crisis David was in. <laughs> There's so many. Right? If you read your Old Testaments and you read about David, he had many uh, difficult seasons. Uh, some of them uh, he did to himself, and then others were just came up, uh, came, came against him, not of his doing. But based off what was written, I think in verse four about him being in a high position, we can safely presume that he wrote this while he was king, right? while he was in a high position. It's quite possible that he was referring to the time when his son Absalom uh, plotted and schemed to, to overthrow him as king. That would have definitely wearied his soul, would it not? That would qualify. That would be something that would weary my soul if one of my children uh, sought to uh, overthrow me in a, in a place of authority, right? That would be troubling to me as a father. So what, what caused David to have a weary soul isn't really what's important in our text. right? Fill in the blank. Any, anything could be the reason. What, how David found rest for his weary soul in the midst of some extremely troubling times, that's what's important for us. That's what's important for us this morning. And so how was David able to find rest? Right? What was the source of his rest? That's what we want to find out. So the first thing that we see in the text is the first of three sources of rest that we have for the weariness of our souls. The first one is the covenant we have with our God. The covenant we have with our God. Verses 1 and 2, he says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. What I find interesting is whatever it was that was happening to David did not cause him to panic. It did not cause him to despair. It's amazing, really. Though his soul was weary, his soul could silently wait for God to act on his behalf. Though his soul was weary and he didn't know how or when, David knew his salvation would come from his God. He knew. He believed this with all of his heart. David knew because his God and only his God was his rock and his salvation. He wasn't looking to another person, another man to, to come to his defense, come to his rescue. He knew that only God could do this. David knew because his God and only his God was his defense and, his, and he would not be greatly moved no matter what his enemies plotted, no matter what they schemed against him. And so how could David's soul find rest in the midst of such adversity? He believed in God and the promises of his God. Right? He believed in God and the promises of his God. God had anointed him as king when he was a young shepherd boy. God had used him to defeat Goliath when everyone else was afraid to even face him. God had protected David from King Saul and many outbursts of jealous rage from the king trying to pin him to the wall with a javelin in his jealous rage. 
God kept His promises and David became king after Saul's great transgression. God gave David one great victory after another over the pagan nation. And so he had a track record with God, a past with God, where God was faithful over and over and over to him. God had made an everlasting covenant with David, and God would never violate his covenant that he makes with his people. We're shown David's response to this covenant in 1 Chronicles 17. Verses 23 to 27. It says, And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever, and do as you have said. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. Did y'all pick up on a word there? Repeated over and over again forever. Forever, forever, forever. When God covenanted with David, He was promising to always be His salvation. When God covenanted with David, He was promising to always be His rock. When God covenanted with David, He was promising to always be His defense. You see, church, in those times when our souls are weary and we are desperate for rest, we can rest because of the covenant that we have with our God, just like David did. We can rest because of the promises that God has made to us in His Word. Now to be clear, we're not under the same covenant as David. We're under the new and final covenant that God has made available to all people, to every tribe, to every nation, and every tongue that, that came to us through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. What is this new covenant that we're under? It's a covenant of everlasting life. In eternal salvation by grace and through faith in God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. We can see this covenant plainly in John 3, 16 and 17. The verses that are precious to us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And so let me just pause and ask, have you covenanted with God through believing in His Son Jesus? Have you done that? Yet if not, today would be a great day to do this. You see, the, the promises of God's Word belong to God's people. They're not for everyone. You must be one of His to lay hold of and claim these promises for yourself. If God has promised to save us, instead of condemning us through believing in His Son, we can be certain that He can give us rest for the weariness of our souls. Amen? If He can handle that, if He's big enough and powerful enough to, to save our souls from eternal hell, He can handle the weariness of our souls, whatever is causing us to be weary. Like David, we don't have to beg and plead with God to give us rest. Like David, our souls can wait silently on God because we know that our God is always going to be our salvation, both presently and and eternally. We know that our God is always going to be our rock, again, both presently and eternally. We can rest because we know our God is going to always be our defense presently and eternally. Nowhere in the New Testament is this made more clear than Romans 8. Romans 8, 31 to 39, another section that we love here at Occupy 2. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As God's people, we can either rest in the promises of God's word or we can be made restless by the lies of the devil. It's a choice. You see, we can either do one or the other, but we cannot do both at the same time. We can either rest in the promises of God, or we can be made restless by the lies of the devil. We can have rest for the weariness of our souls because our God is a covenant-keeping God. Amen? Amen? He always keeps His promises. The same thing that we see in the text is one of the main sources for the unrest and weariness within our souls, the conspiracies of our enemies. Verses 3 and 4, David writes, How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. As I said earlier, I believe that David wrote this whenever he was in the midst of being overthrown by his son Absalom. This grieved David greatly, but not enough for him to want harm to come to his son. If you're familiar with the account, he gave explicit orders to, to not harm him, right? to not take his life. And, and we also know if you're familiar with the stories, those orders were disobeyed. Once the men caught up with his son, if you remember Absalom, apparently he was a beautiful man and he had long hair. I think of, I think of Bart Simpson maybe, kind of a beehive hairdo maybe. And, and he was riding along on his horse and he got caught in the tree limbs and yanked him clean off his horse, horse and he was hanging by his hair and he was just he was stuck and lo and behold the the soldiers came along david's men came and said look god has delivered our enemy and they killed him they took his life they did not spare him as the king had told them to do they killed him anyways these verses i believe weren't directed so much at absalom for this reason because david loved his son Right, even though he conspired against him, he didn't want harm to come to him. But these other men, these other hypocrites that, that helped orchestrate David's overthrow, these are the ones that David was speaking to. Those were nothing but two-faced cowards that took delight in lying to, to David. They would bless him with their mouths outwardly. They would say things like, May the king live forever. Right? But, but, but inwardly they were... They were lying. They were cursing Him. May, may your fall come quickly and painfully. See, David had grace for his son and nothing but condemnation for those wicked men that conspired to cast him down from his high position as king. David was certain. He was certain that they would all be slain for their part in his conspiracy, right? That's what he said. That they would all be slain. It was just a matter of time before they fell because they were like leaning a leaning wall in a tottering fence, right? Just you know, you, we all know that you you ride around town and you see some some fences like you don't know how it's standing up, right? It's like it's it's leaning and leaning and leaning. I think about uh, in uh, downtown Pitkin that that rubble, that old building there. I don't know how it's still standing, leaning walls. Just it's it's going to fall eventually. You know it's going to happen. Same thing. He said it's coming. Judgment is coming. Uh, that, that these men will answer for what they have done. Just a matter of time before they fail. Do you have any enemies that are constantly conspiring against you? I know you have one. That's right. You have the enemy. The enemy is conspiring against, against us all the time. Do you have enemies that pretend to be supportive of you to your face? and then tear you down behind your back. If you're in a position of leadership, I can guarantee you that you do. That's right. You may not be aware of it, 
But it's happening. I can almost promise you that. The good news is that God is always watching our back. And He will take care of our enemies in due time and in a way that He sees fit. Amen? Amen. He's always got our back. He's always watching out for His people. Romans 12, 17-19, he, he says this. Paul writes, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, like David, we can rest in the fact that God will repay our enemies for the weariness that they have caused to our souls. He's going to handle it. He will take care of it. We don't have to fight back because God is our defense. That's what David said, right? God is our defense. Matthew Henry equates resting in God with trusting in God. He, he puts it this way. He said, trusting in God, the heart is fixed. If God be for us, we need not fear what man can do against us. We need not fear what, what man can do against us because God is our defense. We're always going to need rest for the weariness of our souls because we're always going to experience unrest from the conspiracies of our enemies. We're always going to have enemies. Always. That, that, that's that's a, a given. The third thing we see in the text is the second of three sources of rest that we have for the weariness of our souls. The confidence we have in our God. The confidence that we have in our God. Verses 5-7 through seven says, My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. If you're paying attention, verses 5 and 6 are almost a repeat of what was written in verses 1 and 2. Right? You're not, you're not having deja vu. He's just repeating himself. David is reminding his weary soul to wait silently for God and God alone. Right? He's talking to his, his soul. He's talking to himself. David was reminding himself not to give in to the temptation to take matters into his own hands or to place his confidence in anyone or anything else besides his God. It's very tempting, isn't it? To take matters into your own hand. I know it is for me. Often that's what gets us in trouble, isn't it? How often do we take matters into our own hands when we don't feel like God is moving fast enough? How often does that work out well for us? Never. <laughs> right? Never. Right. It never works out well. Uh, again, Warren Wiersbe, his insight here is, is helpful. He said times of waiting can be difficult if we don't depend wholly on the Lord. God's delays are not God's denials. But our impatience can be used by the devil to lead us on dangerous and destructive detours. That's a great place for an amen. Yeah. That's right. we, we know this. You know this. I know this. And you know this from past experience. Even when it seems like God isn't working in our circumstances, we can be confident that He is. That's right. Like David, that should always be our expectation. We should always expect God to be at work in our circumstances. Our God may work in mysterious ways sometimes, but we can be confident that He is always at work in the midst of our circumstances. We shouldn't be shocked that our invisible God often works in invisible ways. Right? right. We don't know what He's doing. We can't always see what He's doing. It's not obvious. And sometimes we don't know until after it's already happened. That's right. And then we can go back like a crime scene investigator and, and, and connect the dots and see, oh, oh, that's how this, God did this. God is the one who worked all this out. It wasn't me. And we can't point to anybody else on why this happened. We know God did. God did. That's why we must walk by faith and not by sight like 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us. Though David was clearly wearied in his soul, his confidence in God remained resolute. The longer he waited silently in his soul for his God to work, the stronger his confidence in his God became. Do you see that? The, the longer he waited in his soul for his God to work, the stronger his confidence 
and God became. Back in verse 2, he said that he shall not be greatly moved. Right? What he's saying there was there's a possibility, right? That he, he might be moved a little. Right back in verse 2. Now here in verse 6, he confidently declares that he shall not, not be moved at all. At all. So the question that, 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 that's begged to be asked here, if you're like me, if we look at this text, what changed in David? Right? Because that, that would be helpful for us. What, what changed in him? How, how did he go from being kind of movable to being immovable so quickly? I believe it's this. He didn't just wait silently in his soul. He waited expectantly in his soul. Right? Expectantly. And so he, he believed that God was going to move. He believed that God was going to intervene. He didn't know when. He didn't know how that God was going to intervene in his circumstance. But he absolutely believed that he would. Just like he had every other time. David would say, well, when, when, did, when did God ever let me down in the past? He just sat there for a while and looked at all of this. He, he didn't there, he didn't there, he didn't there. I, he never has. That's right. He never has and he's not going to start now. That's right. Never has and he's not going to start now. David found rest for the weariness of his soul in the midst of one of the darkest times in his life because he had complete confidence that God was his salvation and his glory, the rock of his strength and his refuge. This reminds me of the confidence that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Right? Those three Hebrew boys, when they were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, right? Because they wouldn't bow down. They wouldn't, they wouldn't worship the, the, the golden image that was erected. They wouldn't worship King Nebuchadnezzar. As God. We see this in Daniel 3, 16 to 18. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Underline those first three words in verse 18. But if not, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. But if not, we know that he can, and we believe that he will, but if not, do we have that kind of confidence in our God? Do you have that kind of confidence in your God. Do we have confidence that God will deliver us from our circumstances, no matter what they might be? Better yet, will our confidence remain even if He chooses not to? Even if He chooses not to? Our God is a good God and all that He does or allows to happen to His people is ultimately what's best for us and what brings Him the most glory. Even when it's not what we wanted. It's even it's no, not what the outcome we desired. It's what's for our best. And what brings Him the most glory. We can have rest for the weariness of our souls because we can always have confidence in our God. The fourth thing that we see in the text is the final of three sources of rest that we have for the weariness of our souls. The confessions of our heart to our God. The confessions of our heart to our God. Verse 8. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. In this final verse, David is exhorting all of God's people to find the rest for the weariness of their souls in God because He is a refuge for all of us. All of us. Not some of us, all of us. Not just for the pastor, all of us. Not just for the deacons, all of us. That's right. All of us. Synonyms for refuge or fortress, sanctuary, shelter, and stronghold. Some of your Bible translations may use those words. Ultimately, a refuge is a place of safety and security. Right? You have these wild animal uh, refuges, right? That's where you. These deer, these massive deer are, are running and, and people see that. I mean, I love to hunt there, but you can't. Why? Because it's a refuge. Because they can live there in safety and security. 
In the Old Testament, God was the one that instituted cities of refuge for individuals that killed another person accidentally. They were allowed to go there and wait until their cases were tried. They could stay there in safety and security. David had learned time and time again through personal experience that pouring out his heart before God was the cure for the weariness of his soul. Anytime he finally would let himself be broken before God and humble himself before God and pour out his heart before God, that's when God moved. That's when God responded. God and God alone was his refuge. Anything that David confessed to God was safe because he knew that God was his refuge. God wasn't going to judge him. God wasn't going to condemn him. God wasn't going to going to uh, uh, cast him away from what he confessed. Likewise, nothing that we confess to our God when we pour our hearts to Him is going to shock Him. It's not going to surprise Him because He already knows. He already knows what, what's in our hearts. He knows the needs that we have before we ever ask. That's what Jesus said in the model prayer. Right? He knows. Our Father knows what we need. The main reason that many of us have weary souls that are desperate for rest is that we're, we are not willing to humble ourselves right. and pour out our hearts to God. Right? That's right. Earlier we talked about enemies exterior, right? That come against us. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. The enemy within. That we will not humble ourselves. We're bearing burdens that God never intended for us to bear on our own. Amen? We're bearing burdens that God never intended for us to bear on our own. We're carrying the guilt and shame of sins that God has already fully and freely forgiven us of. Jesus said in John 8.36, If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Right? We're free. We're free from the guilt and shame of those sins that God's forgiven us of. But sometimes our souls are weary because we have unconfessed sin in our lives. And the weight of that sin is crushing us. Right? It's crushing us. You want to know why you're sick and why you're de depressed and, and why you're run down? You're living in sin. It's eating you up like cancer. What's the cure? What's the answer? How do you, how do you, how do you uh, get refreshed or renewed? You confess it. You confess it to God, right? That, that's the answer. Right? How, how can we unburden ourselves? How, how can we put down the guilt and shame of the sins that we've been forgiven of? How can we get out from under the crushing weight of unconfessed sin in our lives? David's told us how. We see it here. We do what David said to do here and pour out our hearts before God in prayer. Confess everything. Confess everything that is a burden to you. Ask Him to bear those burdens for you. Confess your struggles with guilt and shame. Ask Him to help you to walk in the freedom that His Word says that you already possess. Help. Help. God, help. Help me. Confess all your unconfessed sin to Him. Ask Him to forgive you and He will. That's the promise that we have in 1 John 1, 9, isn't it? 1 John 1, 9 says, If, 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 underline if, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not some unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. And I absolutely love this quote by Donald Williams regarding this verse. He said this, When our hearts have been poured out before Him, when we are the most vulnerable, He is there to embrace us in His love and hold us to His heart. Amen, amen, and amen. See, we can have rest for the weariness of our souls because we can always trust that our God will respond to the confessions of our heart. So this morning, as we wrap up our time together, thinking about what we've seen this morning, what we've heard this morning, makes me think of the heart of Jesus. You know, think about his time with the disciples and like the upper room discourse. And as his time grew near and as he was about to depart, he, he knew the trouble that they would face. He knew the weariness of their souls. He, he, he knew how hard it was going to be for them to, to follow him. But here's what makes the connection for, for us here today. He knows how hard it is for us too. Nothing's changed. 
It, 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 in, in some respects, it's even harder now to follow Jesus than it was then, if you can imagine. Following Jesus is challenging enough on its own. But when we add in all the other challenges of living in a fallen world, add in the crime, the political strife, the economic turmoil, workplace drama, plottings and schemings, terminally ill loved ones, prodigal children, and on and on I could go. That's more than enough to make a soul grow weary. Amen? It's more than enough. So let me just ask, because sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself up here. Am I the only one who has a weary soul this morning? Am I the only one that needs rest? Am I the only one that's willing to admit it? Surely I'm not. Maybe I'm the only one that's tired of pretending. Mm. Tired of pretending that everything's okay. Tired of pretending that I'm doing okay. Right? Maybe that's it. That's right. Everything is not fine and I am not okay. I need rest for my word, so. There. I said it. I said it out loud. Now you know. You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder. Now you know. I'm thankful for a God who loves me and accepts me with my flaws and all. thankful for a God who loves me and has made a way for me to find rest for my soul. A weary soul. King David just told us how, didn't he? He just told us how. But King Jesus did too in Matthew 11. Matthew 11, 28-30 Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus bids us to come to Him to find rest for our weary souls. He bids us come to Him to find rest for our souls in an eternal sense through repentance of sin and faith in Him. But He also bids us come to Him to find rest for our weary souls presently. Presently. How we do this? By pouring out our hearts before God. By coming to Him. Whatever kind of rest your weary soul needs this morning, come to Jesus and you will find the rest that you need. Just come to Jesus. Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. God, we thank You so much for this day that You have made. God, we thank You for Your Word to us this morning. Father, I, and I know that sometimes I, I feel as though I'm preaching to myself, and this is definitely one of those times. But God, maybe... As I preach to myself and, and others that, that they're able to hear and listen in and the instruction that you have given me through your word would also be beneficial to others. But God, I know I'm not alone. Maybe I just don't do as good a job of hiding as other people. But there's no healing when we hide. It's like ignoring a, a, a cancerous lesion on our body that if we just ignore it, it won't go away. It doesn't get better. So God, you, you offer us rest for our weary souls. We see it. We see it in Your Word. You tell us what to do. So Father, help us. Help us to do what Your Word says. Help us this morning. Whatever, whatever burdens we're 
bearing that, that don't belong to us to bear. Help us to give them over to You today. Whatever it is uh, that's causing us to, to be weary, what, whatever guilt or shame of, of sin that, that we've already been forgiven of, God, help us to lay those things down. And God, if there is unconfessed confess sin in our lives, it's almost a certainty that, that all of us have something that we're dealing with, some sin that we struggle with, that we think that we're hiding from You, which is silly. You know all things. You see all things. God, help us to confess those sins. Help us to pour out our hearts before You this morning that we may find rest for the weariness of our souls. Thank You, God. Thank You for loving us. Thank You for Your Son, Jesus. Thank You for the rest that we have through Him and His sacrifice on the cross. On the cross. We thank You for the rest that we have in Him each and every day when we turn to Him, when we come to Him and ask for rest. We love You and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.